Let us pray. Father, we pray that my mouth would be so filled with your gospel that our ears would be filled with the gospel so that our lives would be conformed to the gospel so that this your world would be filled with a gospel people. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. What story are we living in? What story are we playing out in our lives? What story are you and I living in? In J.R. Tolkien's The Two Towers, Samwise Gamgee says to Frodo at one point something about the nature of stories. He says this, he says, adventures, I used to think, were things that folks went out and looked for, but that's not the way of it with the tales that really mattered. Folks seem to have just landed in those stories usually. Their paths were laid that way. I expect they had lots of chances like us of turning back, only they didn't. Mr. Frodo, I wonder what sort of story we've fallen into. What sort of story have we fallen into as Christians? The book of Acts is the answer. The book of Acts answers the question, what sort of story have we stumbled upon, been placed in, fallen into? Acts is the story that we are living out as Christians. And it's an amazing, amazing story. I like how Edgar Goodspeed speaks of the book of Acts this way. He says, where else will be found such a varied series of exciting events, trials, riots, persecutions, escapes, martyrdoms, voyages, shipwrecks, rescues, all set in that panorama of the ancient world, Jerusalem, Antioch, Philippi, Corinth, Athens, Ephesus, Rome, and with such scenery and settings, temples, courts, prisons, deserts, ships, barracks, theaters, has any opera such variety? See, if you're a Christian, the book of Acts is the story you've fallen into. And if you're not a Christian, the book of Acts is the story that can be yours as well. The story of the book of Acts begins this way. If you turn there with me, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Luke writes, In the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach up until the day that he was taken up after he'd given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them of the kingdom of God. And while he was staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. What sort of story is this that we've fallen into? Acts is a story about God's people. It's a story about God's people. These characters and these individuals will meet the good, the bad, and the ugly, all contained in this story. But Acts is also a story about God's power. God's power being brought to bear into a broken and corrupt world and turning it right side up. 
But not only is the book of Acts a story of God's people and a story of God's power, but Acts is a story that God is performing still today. Acts is still being played out today. And that's why I'm determined to spend the rest of 2022 preaching through the book of Acts. And so we begin today asking the question, what sort of story is this that we have fallen into? You see, it's a story first about God's people. Look at verse 1. In the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up. So what Luke, the author, is saying is there was this first book, which we know as the Gospel of Luke, and that recorded all the events of Jesus' life up through his, his death on the cross for the sake of humanity, his resurrection, overcoming the chains of death, declaring himself as the true judge of the world, and then his ascension, enthroned as the king of the cosmos. He says, that's the first book. And this is the second book. This is now the story of God's people. The story of all that follows the resurrection and ascension up until about A.D. 62. Now, the author, Luke, who we're told in Colossians 4 is the beloved physician, he writes this with a benefactor, someone funding it, Theophilus. He's mentioned both at the beginning of Luke's gospel and here at the beginning of Acts. Papyrus was expensive. So Luke is a benefactor, and he writes with the most eloquent Greek we find in the New Testament. This is a literary masterpiece he's writing, and it's very well-researched. Listen to the detail which he discusses about his research back at the beginning of the first book, Luke chapter 1. He says this there. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an order, a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, Just as those who from the beginning were both eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, having studied everything carefully from the beginning, decided to write an orderly account for you, O most excellent Theophilus, so that you might have certainty concerning the things about which you have been taught. But here's what's great about Luke. I love that Luke is not just a detailed, wise, smart, well-educated researcher. But Luke writes also as an eyewitness. See, this strange thing happens in chapter 16, and again in chapter 20 and 21, and then in chapters 27 and 28. Suddenly in the narrative, we're all the way through, Luke has been writing in the third person plural, they went and did such and such, and such and such happened to them. Suddenly in chapter 16, 21, 20, 21, 27, 28, don't worry, we'll get there. He moves to first person. We went, and such and such happened to us. Because Luke is in the story. Luke was not just a researcher, but a traveling companion at times with Paul. You know what this means? That as we read and study these accounts, Luke was actually there at Lydia's conversion, the first European convert. Luke was there when Eutychus fell asleep in the window because Paul preached too long, fell out the window and died, and Paul raised him from the dead. I cannot wait to preach that sermon that Sunday. (laughs) You think I preach long. Luke was there when the prophet Agabus predicted that Paul would be persecuted in Rome. Luke was there in the storm on the ship and in the shipwreck. And Luke was there when they landed on the island of Malta and Paul was bit by the poisonous viper and they all thought he'd die and Paul just shook it off. Luke, the physician, watching this take place. And finally, Luke was there when they arrived in Rome and Paul was placed under house arrest waiting for his trial with Caesar. Luke is not just a researcher. Luke is in this story as an eyewitness. And something really cool happens as well. Between chapters 21 and 27, Luke vanishes from the narrative for a little while. It goes back to third person. They went and did these things. Because for those two years, 
Luke stayed behind in Judea and traveled throughout Judea researching his books, his first and second book. He traveled to places that were in those books, like Nazareth. He interviewed people like the aged Mary, mother of Jesus. How else would Luke be the only gospel writer who could put in the Annunciation story with Elizabeth and the birth narrative with the shepherds and the angels? Luke has painstakingly researched and seen so much of this story, and he puts it down here for us. And we find here a story of God's people, a people who, by Acts chapter 17, less than 20 years after the resurrection, are accused of turning the world upside down. God's people turning the world upside down. And you got to ask, why? How? I mean, we know so many of these names now because of the book of Acts, over 2,000 years of reading and studying, but these were ordinary nobodies back in the first century. How did they turn the world upside down? Because this story is not just a story of God's people, it's a story of God's power. See, there's a bit of a misnomer or misunderstanding in the way this book is titled. A little side note, you know that biblical books don't actually have titles from their authors. The authors didn't write down the title of the book. They just wrote their books. We later on gave them titles so we knew where they were, right? We knew where to find them in the book. The name that's often given to this book is the Acts of the Apostles, right? And it's a bit of a misnomer. It's a bit misleading because what that name suggests is, well, the first book is about all that Jesus did and taught. And the second book then is about what the apostles did and taught, right? Like Jesus got his book and now the apostles get their book. But listen to verse one of Acts chapter one. In the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach with what he began to do. And guess what? He's continued doing it. As he goes into the second book, Jesus continues to be the one doing and teaching through the disciples. It is Jesus who is in fact the one whose power is at work in this story. All that Jesus in the second book continues to do and teach. Because of course, Jesus in the next few verses is going to ascend. He's going to ascend into heaven. Now, we're going to jump over the ascension story and leave that to the end of May when we come back to the feast of the ascension. But in the ascension, let's just summarize it by saying this. In Jesus' own words from John 16, it is a good thing that I go away because if I do not go away from you, I will not send the helper. But if I do go away, he will be sent. This helper, the coming of the Holy Spirit that happens at the ascension. See, Jesus' ascension, his enthronement as the king over the universe, truly doesn't mean a diminishment of his presence. He's not absent suddenly. In fact, the ascension means that Jesus becomes exponentially present because of the ascension, because he sends the Spirit. Put it this way, the Son of God in his 33, earthly minist- 33 years of earthly ministry, because he was incarnate, right, in flesh, could be in one place at one time with one group of people. Now, because he's enthroned as the king of the cosmos, sending out his spirit, suddenly the son of man can now be present in all places at all times with all peoples. He is more present with us because of his ascension than he was during his earthly ministry. Oh, how I can't wait to get back to ascension. But for today, the church is going out in the power of Jesus, not on their own power. A better title for the book would be The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Or maybe best, The Acts of the Holy Spirit Working Through His Church. Because as we see here in verses 4 and 5, 
while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The church's total dependency on the Holy Spirit is contained in Jesus' command, wait. You have to wait for the Spirit because without me, you can do nothing. He'd already said that in John 15. But with me, in my power, there ain't nothing that you can dream that cannot be done in this life. This is what it means to go out in the power of God. The acts of the Holy Spirit working through his church. It's why throughout the book of Acts, as we're going to see, the disciples do miracles just like Jesus. Because it's Jesus, in fact, doing those same miracles through them. The disciples will go through the book of Acts teaching prophetically, powerfully, just like Jesus. Because Jesus is continuing his ministry of teaching through the disciples. As he says in John Chapter 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. See, this story is the story of God's people, the story of God's power. But friends, this is also the story that God is performing Still, today, still playing out in this world, still continuing to tell this story. You see, when you come to the end of the book, Acts chapter 28, it leaves us on a weird cliffhanger. I mean, all this work of Paul going through his three missionary journeys, and finally he's in Rome, and he's made his appeal to Caesar, and you're thinking, I can't wait to see what that's like when Paul actually is giving account before Caesar, and yet we end at the end of chapter 28 with Paul in house arrest, and that's it. And it kind of feels a bit unfinished. It feels like, wasn't there some more to be written? And that's on purpose. Whether it was Luke's intention or whether it was the providential act of God, or let's just say it probably was both. Luke did not record an event that happened only a few years after this. Paul's death. His martyrdom. Luke also didn't record a similar event that happened almost the same time, just a few years later. Peter's death. See, the two major characters in this book, Peter and Paul, if they had their martyrdoms included at the end, it would have kind of sealed the story. You said, all right, well, there's the end, the whole arc of the narrative, it's over. Instead, we're left with an open-ended book because this story is still being written. The intention of God was never for the church to imagine that that's the book of Acts. We can look back as a nice picture of what used to happen. No, this is a story that continues. We're supposed to be left uneasy at the end, asking the question, what does the story continue to look like? Listen to these words from Arthur Pearson. He was the first guy who popularized this concept in modern times of an unfinished record back about 145 years ago. He says this, he says, the records of these acts of the Holy Spirit have never reached completeness. This is the one book that has no proper close because it waits for new chapters to be added so fast and so far as the people of God shall invite the blessed spirit into their living. I'm going to say that again. This is the one book which has no proper close because it waits for new chapters to be added so fast and so far as the people of God shall invite the blessed spirit into our living. See, this is a story that God is performing still today. And he's cast you in that story. He's called you into this story. You've stumbled into this story. You've fallen into this story. You may think you chose this story, but guess what? The story chose you. And this 
is the continuing story that God is performing in this world for the salvation of the world. And you and I are now cast as its characters in our generation. And it's not such a different world today as it was back then. I mean, we have all kinds of modern technology and scientific advancement, but we're still a bunch of pagans fighting over competing gods and obsessed with sex. And we're not that different from these people we find in the book of Acts with their flaws and their sin and their uneven performances, the surprise that they would get called and chosen. I mean, think about it this way. Peter and John, you'll you'll be introduced to all these characters as we go along. But Peter and John will find we're clearly too uneducated. Barnabas was too forgiving. Stephen was just a deacon. Paul was too murderous. James was too Jewish. Cornelius and Timothy and Apollos were too Greek. Lydia was too busy with her fabric business. Mark was too much of a flake. Eutychus, too sleepy. Dorcas was too dead. And Phoebe and Theophilus were too rich. And yet God cast them all in this story. He used them all to turn the world upside down. And now those characters wait and watch you and I completing the story they played out. They stand in the bleachers now watching this continual story of salvation being played out in your life, in my life, in our homes, in our businesses, in our schools, in our communities. I love the words of Hebrews chapter 11, that great hall of heroes of the faith, describes the waiting of these saints, these cast of characters from the book of Acts, along with all the other characters from Scripture, waiting and watching us now. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be perfect. They don't fully enter into their inheritance. They wait for us as we perform this same continuing story. I'm going to close with this, that my surname is pretty rare you probably never met any other Donisons, not Denisons or Donaldsons, Donison, this spelling. Because when we came over from Romania on my dad's dad's side, they invented a name, an anglicized name for us. And so no other family did that. So every time I meet anyone with the exact spelling of my last name, they are a relation. A number of years ago at Regent College, Monica was the receptionist. And so in walks this person who she says is the spitting image of my uncle. I mean, identical twin to my uncle. Walks in, he sees the nameplate with Donison on it, says, who's the Donison? I'm a Donison. There's no Donisons. They start talking. She comes and grabs me. It turns out that this is one of my distant cousins. We track the family roots back together and we sit there at seminary having coffee together And we're explaining how we're relatively new Christians and how we're coming out of the non-denom world and we're trying this liturgical, sacramental, a bit, bit more traditional kind of church thing. And he laughs and he says, of course you are. Of course you're going into a more liturgical, sacramental tradition. He said, don't you know your story? You come from a long line of Romanian Orthodox priests. You know, Romanian Orthodox, like the long beards, robes. They're taller than me, but still. (laughs) Suddenly, I realized that I was part of a bigger story. A deeper, longer, richer, amazing story that I wasn't even aware I was a part of. And that's what it's like for a Christian to read the book of Acts. Acts. 
to realize that this is our story. Rich and deep and long and more than you could even imagine for your life. This is the story that we've fallen into. A story about God's people now, including you and I. A story about God's power, now that power by the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and I. And a story that is being performed by God still in our generation. And we have been chosen to be the cast of characters in his power for the sake of the world. For his glory. In the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. The second book, it's still being written. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.